mais uma sessão clínica do Hospital São Lucas Copacabana de Nefrologia e hoje estamos muito honrados em termos uma convidada internacional, é a doutora Iman Alchanzi, ela é nefrologista de Abu Dhabi, nos Emirados Árabes, é, e ela gentilmente aceitou o nosso convite, e ela vai falar um pouco sobre trombocitopenia induzida por heparina. É, ela vai estar tá também, também conosco na sessão, está o meu amigo Flávio Naco, que é intensivista é, aqui da UFRJ, onde trabalhamos juntos, e também do Hospital Procardíaco, e já muito antes de HIT virar moda com o negócio das vacinas do Covid, o Flávio já se interessava, né, Flávio? Eu sou testemunha disso. Então, é, eu tive o prazer de chamar ele, meu amigo, e ele gentilmente aceitou mais uma vez. Então, obrigado, Flávio, aí, pela sua presença. Queria agradecer Sim, também ao meu, é amigo, meu amigo Tiago é. Reis, de, de Brasília, que foi quem me apresentou a IMA e está aqui conosco também. É, então, vamos começar. Vou falar com a doutora IMA em inglês. É, e vou começar agora. Uh, so, hi, Iman. Uh, I introduce you in Portuguese, but I would like to introduce you again in English. Dr. Iman Al Shamsi is a nephrologist from Abu Dhabi on the United Arab Emirates, and uh, she gently accepted our invitation to give us a lecture on heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And we're very happy to have her here with us. And please, uh, Dr. Iman, uh, you can start. Thank you. Shukra, okay. shukra. Thank you. Thank you. So, bom dia. Quiero agradecer a doctores Tiago Viz e Pedro Rocha por la oportunidad. Meu nome é He Heyman. É um prazer estar aqui com vocês hoje. Isso é tudo que eu sei falar em português. So, I'm sure Very good. good. <laughs> Very good. Couldn't, okay. couldn't have said it better. <laughs> so, so let's start. Um, so I have nothing to disclose except that I'm a nephrologist talking about the hematology topic. So I hope I do a good job in that. So uh, I would like to start with a, a commentary that was published in the, the Archives of Internal Medicine, uh, which is uh, uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia myths and misconcepts. So the author says that if it is very rare, maybe we don't have to worry or learn about it. But uh, uh, as we know, like uh, thrombo heparin induced thrombocytopenia can occur to up to 5% of patients receiving intravenous and fractionated heparin. And the incidence is lower with the patient receiving low molecular weight heparin or catheter flushes. It's uh, about 0.5%, but uh, it uh, carries a very high mortality and risk of uh, gangrene and amputation. Um, I'd like to, to share this uh, case presentation uh, that uh, was published by uh, Davenport in uh, uh, 2009 with a very excellent review uh, about the topic in uh, patients with end-stage renal disease. So the case is an 83-year-old man on uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis for three years for end-stage kidney disease. The patient was admitted with peritonitis. The peritoneal dialysis catheter was removed due to refractory infection. The patient then was shifted to hemodialysis. And uh, on day 10, the patient was due for dialysis before discharge. Uh, unfortunately, uh, three minutes into the dialysis session, the patient reported feeling unwell, dizzy, and short of breath. The, the patient became unconscious and uh, had non-recordable blood pressure or pulse and died despite attempts at resuscitation. Um, a post-mortem investigation was done and uh, the, the patient's uh, platelets as shown here in the figure uh, dropped uh, significantly between day five and seven. The patient received uh, prophylactic uh, subcutaneous uh, porcine and fractionated heparin during the admission, plus the catheter lock, and he received IV boluses of uh, unfractionated heparin uh, during the dialysis sessions. Of course, the uh, differential diagnosis include the uh, dialyzer reaction, anaphylaxis, um, uh, cardiovascular events, uh, or hair embolus. Uh, but uh, the, some, some tips uh, or hints uh, to the diagnosis in this case, that the, before the patient collapsed, the patient had a, a high arterial and venous pressure. Uh, and uh, raised the uh, suspicion of catheter-associated thrombus. Uh, we'll talk about the T-score, uh, but the pa this patient uh, T-score, pre-test probability score was eight out of eight. 
ELISA that was done and it was positive when with an optical density more than one. And the patient had a positive heparin induced platelet aggregation test. An assay for mast cell triptase was negative, which was not done to exclude uh, anaphylaxis. So this is the CT scan, which is described as uh, uh, intravenous uh, edema, um, which is uh, also like, uh, as the author stated, uh, typical of pseudopulmonary embolus syndrome. So the pseudopulmonary embolus uh, term can be used in uh, patients who clinically present uh, as uh, pulmonary embolism, but uh, uh, like in this case, for example, uh, alveolar uh, edema, or uh, in other cases in the literature where uh, malignancy uh, leads to obstruction of the airway. So in this presentation, by the end of the presentation, I hope I will be able to answer these uh, questions. So why should nephrologists know more about uh, HIT? Uh, how does HIT develop? What is the recommended approach to diagnosis? How should we treat HIT? And what is vaccine-induced uh, immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia? So the, uh, the, uh, the of, uh, uh, dialysis uh, was not um, uh, widespread uh, until the advent of uh, anticoagulation because the dialyzer membrane itself is a procoagulant and activates both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So unfractionated heparin, as we see, uh, inhibits antithrombin-3 and thus uh, inhibits uh, factor 10 and uh, thrombin. Uh, other anticoagulants, for example, heparinoids, low molecular weight heparin, inhibit uh, the uh, activity of uh, factor 10. Direct thrombin inhibitors and inhibit uh, thrombin, as the name indicates, and citrate inhibit calcium. Going into the heparin uh, timeline, it, it is of interest that uh, heparin was first discovered by a, a medical student uh, in uh, Johns Hopkins. He was supposed to find a procoagulant uh, uh, substance in the liver. He failed to find the procoagulant state, but uh, procoagulant molecule, but he succeeded to find heparin, uh, which is an uh, uh, anticoagulant uh, uh, medication that we use even uh, after 100 years from its discovery. So the first uh, 50 years, uh, the process was uh, to uh, uh, prepare the best uh, preparation what is better, bovine lung, bovine liver, uh, porcine, uh, mucosa, uh, bovine lungs. And then, uh, then it was uh, like introduced into uh, the clinical use. And in 1957, the first hit uh, case was described. Uh, heparin also uh, suffered, suffered from other crises like uh, in the 1990s in the UK uh, due to the bovine Spongiform encephalitis or mad cow disease. Uh, the use of uh, bovine uh, heparin was uh, on hold in the UK. And uh, also, uh, due to the contaminated heparin crisis, due to the oversulfated chondritan sulfate uh, produced in China in the, in the year 2007 2008, which led to many uh, deaths of patients on dialysis. So, uh, what I'm trying to see to show in this slide is that heparin has been in use for a long time. It has suffered, suffered lots of crisis, but it is still in use. Uh, this slide yeah. that uh, uh, heparin structure. So heparin yeah. is uh, um, it's a sulfated uh, yeah. uh, and uh, it is heparin sulfate, which is present in the extracellular matrix. And we will get to know why am I showing that uh, in a few slides. So uh, we'll talk about the pathogenesis of it. Uh, this slide, uh, slide is a bit busy, um, and I'd like to have your attention. So uh, in a patient who is uh, already sick um, with uh, like bacterial infection or fungal infection, uh, there will be platelet activation. Uh, the platelets uh, release the platelet factor 4 from the alpha granules. Now, the released platelet factor 4 can uh, actually occur, uh, can have an opsonization effect, uh, which help uh, uh, remove the pathogens from the system uh, after uh, being opsonized with the uh, like platelet factor 4 and the antibodies. And then they're released, um, removed from the system by macrophages. 
But uh, you imagine this patient now who's already having an infection and the release of factor, platelet factor uh, four in the system, being admitted in the hospital and being exposed to heparin. So now the heparin molecules bind the platelet factor four and uh, changes uh, new epitopes to uh, uh, be exposed to the antibodies. The antibody um, antigen complex activates the platelets by, by uh, binding the FC gamma receptor, uh, which leads uh, to uh, further activation of platelets and further uh, thrombin release. Uh, other than that, uh, remember the heparin sulfate, which has a structurally similar, uh, which is structurally similar to uh, heparin. Now the uh, platelet factor four and the antibodies can bind the endothelial cells leading to further activation and release of thrombin. So uh, to, to elaborate on the clinical presentation, first I would like to uh, go about uh, um, uh, clarify the nomenclature about uh, type one and type two uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So the term type one heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which refers to a milder uh, form of thrombocytopenia that is not associated with uh, thrombosis and that is not associated with uh, an immune phenomena. The term is uh, discouraged uh, to be used by uh, some experts as uh, it is reserved for type, uh, as HIT is reserved for type 2 heparin induced thrombocytopenia, which is the immune type, uh, which is a, a rarer form, but a more severe form. So, to, to more further elaborate, I want to go about, uh, to go in details about uh, the 4T score. So, the 40s uh, stand for the magnitude of thrombocytopenia, the timing of thrombocytopenia, presence of thrombosis, and the fourth T is actually like second letter, which is other potential causes. And the score can be for each element, zero, one, or two. Uh, this score is available online, and there are other score, uh, scores as well for heparin in this thrombocytopenia. But uh, the fourth T score is the more popular one. So regarding the uh, magnitude of uh, thrombocytopenia. Um, we can give a score of two if the pa patient had a platelet four of uh, more than 50% or a minimal, uh, a minimal uh, platelet number or a nadir of platelet of uh, 20. And uh, the patient had no uh, recent surgery with the past, uh, within the past three days. Um, the patient can get a score of zero if the platelet four is less than 30 or if the nadir is uh, less than 10. So a score of one is some, something in between uh, the score of two or, and zero. The, um, the, the important thing to notice is that sometimes the patients will have a 50% drop from the platelet count, for example, from 300 to 150, but it will not be uh, in the thrombocytopenia uh, definition. Another uh, important factor is that uh, like if a sick patient is transferred from another facility, uh, this uh, platelet count drop can be overlooked. Sorry. So the timing of thrombocytopenia, if the, uh, the timing occurred between day five and 10, or the patient had a previous exposure uh, within the past uh, 30 days to heparin, and then with re-exposure, the patient had a, um, a drop in the platelet count. That's a score of two. Uh, a score of zero is if the patient had uh, the, uh, the platelet count drop within less than four days and uh, no previous exposure to heparin. And uh, a score of one is something in between. To uh, further elaborate about the timing, I uh, hope you like my drawing. So this is like... Uh, with the initiation, this is the classic hit. Uh, this is the initiation of heparin. Uh, between seven and 14 days or seven and 10 days, thrombocytopenia occurs. So rapid onset hit is that the patient is previously exposed to uh, heparin, and then the patient is readmitted or re-exposed to heparin, and then the thrombocytopenia occurs right away. In the late onset uh, hit, which is I, uh, something I did not describe yet, is that uh, after the... Uh, uh, heparin exposure already ends, uh, the patient can uh, develop it within uh, two to three weeks. And this is due to auto reactivity of uh, 
uh, the uh, antibodies that they can uh, damage the uh, or activate the platelets in the absence of heparin. Uh, regarding thrombosis, so a score of two uh, is given if the patient has a confirmed thrombosis or skin necrosis at the injection site or an anaplectoid reaction last, like the patient I presented, or uh, in a case of adrenal hemorrhage, which occur usually secondary to thrombosis. Uh, a score of one is uh, given to a patient who has a recurrent thrombosis on anticoagulation or uh, suspicious uh, thrombosis awaiting images or erythema at the, the site of infection, injection, not uh, necrosis. And the uh, score of zero is in uh, the absence of thrombosis. These are some of the clinical hits. So this is a, the, there is an erythema, that's a score of one. There is skin necrosis, that's a score of two. Then uh, deep venous thrombosis or gangrene, that's a score of two. So uh, as you can imagine, like uh, the patient who is admitted uh, to a hospital, especially in uh, uh, following, uh, uh, for example, uh, cardiac surgery or uh, in an ICU with uh, uh, sepsis, they are uh, likely to have causes of uh, thrombocytopenia, like an infection, a confirmed bacteremia or congenia. Uh, or pangemia, chemotherapy or radiation in the past 20 days, DIC or uh, post-transfusion purpura, which is actually a very rare um, reaction to blood transfusion. So that's a score of zero. If there's no alternative, that's a score of two. Um, so we know that like uh, for thrombocytopenia to occur, uh, we'll have to have uh, increased, consum uh, increased consumption of platelet or uh, decreased production or sequestration of platelets. And for thrombosis, it's the vertical triad of uh, uh, stasis, endothelial uh, injury, and uh, uh, hypercoagulable state. Uh, but we know that thrombocytopenia usually causes, causes bleeding. So what if the, we have thrombocytopenia, but uh, the, there is thrombosis? Uh, other uh, conditions we have to think about, uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, massive PE in which platelets are actually consumed, antiphospholipid syndrome, infective endocarditis, DIC, and the uh, PNH practice from maternal hemoglobinuria. Uh, this slide is uh, taken from the American Society of Pathology 2018 guidelines for management of uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So, uh, it's, uh, just to tell you that after calculating the 4T score, what should we do? So if the patient has a low clinical probability, which is uh, equal to or uh, less than three, then HIT is unlikely and uh, the patient does not uh, need further investigations. If the patient has uh, an intermediate or high risk uh, probability, uh, then we should discontinue heparin use and use uh, non-heparin anticoagulant, obtain an immune assay. If the immune assay, uh, which is usually an ELISA, if the ELISA is positive, uh, then uh, we should go for a uh, functional assay, which is the, uh, I will talk about the certain release assay, uh, is one of them. Um, and uh, if, it's, uh, if the uh, test is negative, then uh, we should uh, try to find uh, other uh, causes of uh, it. So, uh, but of course, the clinical judgment uh, plays an important role. Retesting is usually not recommended. Uh, so, uh, as I just described, the uh, uh, ELISA test is uh, uh, usually done as uh, um, uh, 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 first uh, screening assay uh, uh, after uh, we get a high probability or an intermediate probability score. Uh, functional assays in include the serotonin release assay or the heparin induced platelet activation test. Uh, both of them are not widely available. There is serotonin release assay involved uh, radioactive substances, uh, and they both uh, involved getting the uh, donor platelets. Um, so they are not widely available. In our uh, hospital, we use the flow cytometry. Uh, in uh, different settings, uh, the rapid test is uh, used because in, uh, in a setting where you suspect heparin uh, induced from cytopenia, uh, and especially if the patient has bleeding, you want to uh, be sure 
uh, that uh, whether the patient needs an alternative anticoagulation or not. So this is uh, like a, a usually called uh, the iceberg model, is that there are, uh, so the ELISA test is, uh, has a carry, uh, it carries a high negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value is uh, very low, but it uh, goes uh, higher with the uh, higher probability of it. So there are more people having uh, positive ELISA screen uh, testing than those having a positive functional test. And uh, less patients have uh, hit without thrombosis and even less patients have hit with probable thrombosis. So remember the frequency I cited in the beginning of the presentation. So it's actually not, uh, it's partly correct, but it depends on the, it depends on the uh, cohort of patients you are looking at. So if we want to look at, for example, surgical uh, patients, they're uh, more likely to test uh, positive for the antigen test or the functional test. Uh, but when you compare the frequency of actual HET to the percentage of uh, uh, patients who are positive with the uh, testing, it's actually lower and even lower for patients with thrombosis. Now, the medical patients have a uh, a lower incidence of uh, positive uh, tests and even a lower incidence of uh, thrombosis. What about patients with uh, end-stage renal disease? There are multiple uh, publications done uh, to look at, uh, to answer this question. So uh, the, uh, the antigen test uh, uh, has a variable uh, uh, positive result in different studies done in different uh, centers, but uh, thrombos uh, thrombosis is actually uh, low uh, in patients who have uh, uh, hit on dialysis. And this is an interesting study, which is actually what they did is they followed uh, uh, 212 patients at the initiation of dialysis and up to uh, two years uh, of uh, dialysis. And they found out that they divided patients into three main groups, and this is the control, um, like a testing uh, patients whether the test is truly uh, significant. So they, they divided the patients into three groups, those with uh, uh, high uh, antibody titer, sorry, high antibody titer, uh, weak uh, positive, uh, or uh, which is uh, 0.4 optical density to one, or less, uh, actually, like, uh, or uh, I thought it was less than 0.4. So it's like, the, uh, it uh, depends on the, uh, how strong the uh, the uh, optical density of the ELISA test was. So what I want to see, say really is that when the uh, test was strongly positive, with the follow-up, the, uh, the antibody titer wears off uh, fast. If the patient had a weak positive, uh, this is the weak positive, then it takes a longer time to uh, resolve. So what about the management? So uh, this is an old uh, study done in the 1990s, uh, and they followed the patients uh, who developed it uh, only like if, if the only management was stopping uh, heparin or heparin products, the patients had a cumulative uh, risk, risk of around 50%. Uh, so stopping uh, heparin only is not enough. Then we have to give them alternative anticoagulation. So uh, in patients with uh, end-stage renal disease, the alternative anticoagulation that we can use in the acute setting is argatroban or rivaluridine. Uh, it depends on the uh, familiarity of the team uh, with, with which one to use. And uh, the availability as not all of them are available in different centers. Now, fundoparinox is actually um, uh, in many studies uh, cited as contraindicated. But in our center, we used it uh, in, uh, in one patient uh, who had uh, hit uh, with uh, no uh, complications of bleeding. There are some studies in the literature that describes the use of paranox in patients with uh, hit on uh, dialysis. So I actually took part of the um, flowchart just to highlight. So uh, for end-stage renal disease patients, other than using the uh, uh, the anticoagulation that we just uh, mentioned, we can also use heparin free dialysis, but there will be all, always the risk of thrombosis. And uh, we can use the citrate block, or we can transit the patient to peritoneal dialysis. 
further considerations is that uh, in patients uh, in whom there is no uh, significant, uh, like uh, clinically significant thrombosis, a bilateral lower extremity compression ultrasound to screen for asymptomatic proximal deep vein thrombosis should be done uh, because this will help uh, determine the duration of uh, anticoagulation. We should avoid pit uh, transfusion, RBC uh, filter insertion, and should avoid also the use of warfarin before platelet recovery to more than 150. So the duration of the anticoagulation depends on the uh, absence of, the, uh, like presence or absence of thrombosis. So in the case of thrombosis, we consider three months of anticoagulation. And in case of uh, no thrombosis, at least four weeks of anticoagulation. Um, what about uh, in patients on uh, hemodialysis uh, in whom uh, we want to reintroduce uh, uh, low, molecular, uh, low molecular weight uh, heparin? There are a few uh, 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 studies, sorry, few studies published in the literature describing uh, uh, reintroducing uh, low molecular weight heparin in patients uh, in whom the, uh, uh, the antibodies uh, became negative. Uh, so the antibody remained detectable in, a, in the circulation for up to 80 days uh, after the uh, diagnosis of HIT. Uh, and they, they, they uh, show their experience that in four patients, like the, the studies that, that are published are really small studies. So in four uh, patients in this study, uh, they had no uh, recurrence of thrombosis or anaphylactoid reaction. Uh, in... Uh, Bigger studies looking uh, at uh, uh, patients, uh, not only with uh, the dialysis patient, the uh, incidence of recurrence uh, was up to 2%. Uh, I would like to end with the uh, vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia. So I tried to summarize the uh, studies that were uh, uh, published in the literature uh, after uh, March and April of uh, this year. Uh, so what was described is after the, uh, the patients or after the, uh, uh, the, the people who were uh, in the beginning uh, did not have any uh, diseases. So after the patient, uh, the people received the uh, adenovirus vector vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, in uh, some case series, they developed uh, thrombosis. Uh, about uh, five to 20 days after the vaccination. And uh, the presentation was mainly of cerebral vein thrombosis. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the patients uh, tested for, uh, tested, po tested positive for uh, platelet uh, factor four polyanion uh, uh, antibody uh, testing, uh, which is uh, uh, similar to the uh, uh, test used for uh, the uh, heparin and dystrombocytopenia antibodies. However, uh, when the uh, heparin was introduced to the uh, uh, test or the ELISA, there, there was no, no further clotting. So heparin did not worsen this condition. That's why in some uh, case series, they actually used low molecular weight heparin or heparin uh, in treating the patients with the thrombosis. But in most of the studies, they also used non-heparin anticoagulation. They also used uh, IVIG uh, to block the FC receptor on the platelets and the uh, WBCs. The condition carried uh, a mortality, uh, which is uh, in, in this uh, case series of like three out of five, uh, seven out of 23, six out of 11, and three out of eight. In August uh, this year as well, there was a publication of the largest pub publication of uh, patients with vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, uh, which includes 220 patients. Uh, the mortality was around 20%. Uh, most of the patients, the, um, the most common presentation was cerebral vein thrombosis, followed by uh, pulmonary artery uh, thrombosis and uh, thrombosis at multiple sites. Higher mortality was with platelet count below 30, thousand and the patients who had intracranial hemorrhage. I hope this presentation helped uh, in answering the questions I promised to answer at the beginning. So I want to end with this. Uh, so at medical schools, uh, we are usually taught that uh, physicians know from medical school when you hear hoofbeat, think horses, but sometimes it's a zebra, the rare diagnosis. 
So if you don't suspect it, you can't detect it. And uh, we have to balance this by not trying to overdiagnose. So clinical impression and uh, the clinical judgment is uh, actually key. So I'd like to end by saying that uh, Espero que tengan gustado de les. I'm saying it correctly, so I'll say it again. Espero que tengan gustado de les. Espero encontrarlos los Emirados Árabes o no Brasil. Obrigado. You couldn't have said it better. Perfect Portuguese. Much better than my habit. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, I would like to congratulate Dr. Iman on a brilliant lecture. I think she covered all the aspects of hyperin-induced thrombocytopenia, including the more actual uh, aspects of uh, related to COVID vaccine and the adverse reaction seen predominantly with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, what, what types of vaccine do you have there at Abu Dhabi, Dr. Iman? We, we use uh, Sinopharm and Pfizer. Okay. So, so here we. I took the Sinopharm. You took the Sinopharm, yeah. Because I it's think like I... an older, older kind of preparation. I was like, yeah. So wait and see. Uh, so, so can you choose, or, or you go to yeah. a station who will give you whatever, which whichever they have, or, or can you choose there? You, you could choose whatever you want. And okay. people usually take the Pfizer because it's uh, it helps in traveling. So. Okay. Not the protection nowadays. Yes. Uh, so it was a brilliant lecture. I, I have some questions, but first I'll, I'll, I'll give the word to Flavio, my good friend. Flavio, thank you very much once again. And please uh, go ahead. Um, good afternoon, uh, Pedro. Um, thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's an honor, it's a privilege to be here. And I'd like to congratulate Iman for the outstanding presentation. So uh, HIT is a serious complication of heparin therapy, as you said, that is under diagnosis because it's not well known by the physician. Um, actually, when I first was introduced to HIT, for me, it was a mystery how an anticoagulant can cause thrombosis. It's the same to say that uh, an anticonvulsivant agent is causing seizures or an analgesic drug is causing pain. Um, the diagnosis is challenging. It's very challenging because we have to think about the disease with the heparin and we have to choose another anticoagulant. Um, in Brazil, it's quite difficult to have the confirmation of the diagnosis because the confirmatory tests take a long time to come back. So they are not helpful. Iman, in your hospital, how many days or how many hours after you request, you have the result of the lab test that confirm the diagnosis of HIT? Okay. So in, uh, in our hospital, we don't use the uh, ELISA or the certain release assay. What we use is the flow cytometry. Because, uh, uh, it, for, so like we have to understand that it's not really yet in the guidelines, the flow cytometry, uh, but it's uh, more available in hospitals. So that's why uh, it can be easier to obtain. Um, the ELISA itself carries a, a, a negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value is uh, not very good. So it's like uh, something in between like 10 to 40. So if you get it positive, as if you didn't get anything, right? So, and uh, the, uh, we don't have any uh, labs that we have, uh, we can uh, do the serotonin release assay or the other functional tests. So we rely mainly on the flow cytometry. There are some publications in the literature uh, stating that uh, it will be like maybe the more emerging test. 
And uh, another uh, test that can be used in the setting, especially in ICU, is the rapid uh, um, antigen test. It gives you the result within hours. But the issue with that test is that you'll have uh, like, a, I don't know, like it depends on the hospital and uh, how they see it as important. Uh, so for something very rare, do you want to get the reagent and maybe it will uh, uh, not really uh, be used or um, uh, it, it depends on like how the, uh, the hospital sees it as important. So you can have in, in a few hours the result. Uh, we don't have the rapid antigen test. It, can, it is used in some of the hospitals, but not in our hospital. In our hospital, we do flow cytometry, which takes a week. A week? Yes. So in, in that week, we'll have to decide whether to uh, start, uh, like, uh, usually, like, uh, we use Argatroban, mainly in patients in ICU. Um, but we have a case of uh, uh, a dialysis patient who was uh, maintained on... So you make the diagnosis based on clinical grounds, right? Um, you suspect the diagnosis, then you, you discontinue the heparin and you start a second anticoagulant. And after a few days, you have the lab results. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. Oh, okay. So in Brazil, when we suspect of the diagnosis, we discontinue the heparin and we use fondaparinux. That's the only um, alternative anticoagulant that we have available. The problem of the fondaparinux is that it's not good for patients with uh, renal you know, kidney disease. So, yeah. But it's the only option we have. So you follow uh, factor 10, activated factor 10 for the uh, uh, fondiparinox. How do you, how do you then uh, follow the uh, anticoagulation when, when patients are on fondiparinox? With the uh, factor 10A, activated factor 10A? We can use factor 10A. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, uh, in the patient, so like I have, I have seen only like uh, two confirmed uh, cases of, not many. Uh, like when I started, uh, started first reading about uh, HIT, I was like, I'm going to find uh, the 5% you know, of patients or whoever, like according to the uh, um, uh, published uh, literature, what is the prevalence, right? But then, so I, I started reviewing the patients that we have in our dialysis center. Uh, 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 and other dialysis centers, which we have around 1,300 patients. And we on, I only found one confirmed case. So my theory is that maybe, uh, as we know that uh, the first, uh, like the first uh, few months or uh, three months uh, of initiation of dialysis, it carries a high mortality. So maybe part of the high mortality uh, occurs because of undiagnosed. So maybe we have to be more vigilant while starting patients on dialysis in the first few months. Iman, and do you, do you have any experience with alternative oral anticoagulant besides warfarin? So um, patients on dialysis are, we, we usually don't use the alternative uh, like the, the DOAX or direct uh, oral anticoagulation, except like, some patients on uh, uh, with atrial fibrillation, they are on apixaban. They're on uh, low dose apixaban, 2.5. Uh, so the cardiologists uh, um, have convinced us that they can use it safely. And we're following the, the cohort of patients with atrial fibrillation on apixaban. Now, uh, uh, if patients are not with uh, chronic kidney disease, there, uh, there is a, actually a study on rivaroxaban that it can be used in patients with uh, uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia with uh, a good, uh, uh, with, uh, like uh, low risk of uh, rethrombosis. Okay. Flavio, uh, uh, we have one question from Thiago. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll call him to, to ask you personally. Uh, I just have some, some 
pointers here. Uh, one thing that, that Flavio always told us, and that's very relevant, and that, now it's common practice here in, in ICUs in Brazil, uh, that most of the arterial lines, they had a minimal concentration of heparin to avoid thrombosis. And this was one of the factors that could be leading to a hit um, in, in some patients on, on critical care here. So now it's common practice not to use uh, heparinized saline on arterial lines uh, in, in critical patients. And that, that's something very relevant. And I, I assume that that's common practice there in, uh, in Abu Dhabi as well. And uh, regarding anticoagulation in patients on dialysis, we have a, a great specialist here, Dr. Thiago. Uh, citrate is used predominantly to continuous renal replacement therapy, but uh, there are some protocols as well to intermittent hemodialysis, and I, I think that he can talk about it. So, Thiago, if you could open your mic, my friend, and, and talk about, please, about uh, give uh, ask your questions to Iman, and also if you can say some words about citrate in also in intermittent hemodialysis. So, uh, Hyman, uh, an excellent presentation. Flavio, uh, nice moderation. Uh, I, I have no experience with uh, citrate in patients on uh, maintenance hemodialysis, but in Europe, uh, it, they have for some patients where the dialysate buffer is not bicarbonate, rather is citrate. So those patients with contraindications for uh, anticoagulation, they use this solution. Three years ago in France, there was a high mortality on those patients, uh, but then they could not make the link between the citrate buffer with, with the high mortality rate. So it's safe to use it. And we have alternatives for patients that uh, cannot use anticoagulations, which are filters with heparin grafted inside the fibers. In, in Europe, they have evodial, and for, uh, uh, for patients on, on CRT, Baxter provides Oxiris. However, it's big, it's in capital letters in Oxiris that you should avoid in patients with diagnosis of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So I think that uh, uh, for our patients here in Brazil, uh, we don't have the citrate solution for, for maintaining hemodialysis patients. So we have to do to the old way of giving uh, saline flushes during the, the hemodialysis session. Do you agree, Pedro? Yes, uh, I have a minimal experience with patients, not on intermittent hemodialysis, but on, on sledge uh, with a adapted citric protocol with commercially available uh, solutions with bicarbonate as buffers. And it works uh, reasonably well. You use a... a ionic calcium on the filter above what we use on, on CRT at around 0 0.45. Uh, and, and, and it works. We have a publication on the Brazilian Journal of Nephrology in 2008 or nine. Um, but but I, I agree with you. It's not practical. Uh, it, it's very different from what we do on CRRT and uh, it probably don't work. And one thing that I liked a lot on Iman's lecture uh, is that she, although she has a, a response time, ex excellent response time to this test, I, I ordered one today. It's a great coincidence. I'm, I'm having a case here that I'm accompanying that, that's a post-vaccine probably, a Pfizer vaccine. The patient had a thrombus on the aorta and had to go mechanical thromboembolectomy and had no... Uh, significant autoiliac uh, disease of atherosclerotic plague. So it's a possibility. And, and the lab is giving us seven to 10 days to give the results. So um, one thing that Flavio says a lot is the scores, the probability score, the vacutin test, the, the 40s. Uh, it helps uh, to make the decision regarding the therapeutic um, in cases where you don't have the exam right away. And I think Flavio, uh, in Procardico as well, it takes about seven to 10 days at least, right, to, to get the result. So, so regarding your patient? More than that, more than that. Yeah. Okay. The, the patient you just uh, mentioned is, uh, is on, on the paranoid now? 
No, uh, this is today, man. She she was admitted at 4:30 a.m. today. So we're still looking around, and and we'll probably she she will use intravenous immunoglobulin, and we'll decide regarding the the anticoagulation. She did uh, an intervention, and she had a thromboembolectomy. So uh, the vascular surgeon uh, he was, and, and she has 25,000 platelets. So uh, we are a little worried regarding anticoagulation at this time. Then she responded well to the to the to the procedure, so we're still deciding. But uh, I think it's important to have the test. So Thiago has also a question. If if you can go ahead, Thiago, regarding the porcine and bovine heparin, right? I uh, I think I think what's not it was not me, but uh, anyway, I can add I can just add that in refractory cases we can use plasma freezes as a way to remove antibodies if IgIG <laughs> does not work. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, it, it's someone with the same name as you. It's our friend Tiago here from Rio. Uh, Tiago okay. without an H. You're with okay. an H, right? Right. <laughs> so that's what got me confused. So, so it's uh, Tiago without an H, a friend of ours, a nephrologist here from Rio, is asking you, Iman, if you, if you know if there is any difference in the incidence of HIT in patients that use the bovine and the porcine uh, model of heparin. Okay, so... Uh... What I read is that with the porcine uh, uh, preparation, there is more like uh, allergic reactions uh, with the, uh, I, I came across it, but I can't remember right now, like which one has more probability of it. I can look it up and, uh, and get back to you. Maybe you can share it with uh, Dr. Chiago, Chiago from Rio, right? From here. Okay. So I, I, I came across it while reading, but I don't remember right now. But I thought like there, there was actually something interesting. I don't know uh, whether you know about it. They, they, in one of the review articles, they were saying that there was an incidence of uh, increased bleeding in uh, patients on dialysis in Brazil because they shifted from bovine to porcine or something. Did you, came, uh, did you come across it? I'm not aware. Are you aware of this, Flavio Chago? I'm not aware. No, I'm not aware. Okay. Um, so uh, one more thing, actually, like I wanted to uh, bring up, is that uh, like in in uh, some in some units, uh, for example, in our unit, we already shifted from using uh, unfractionated heparin to long lived rate heparin in all the patients, almost all the patients, like the ones who are chronic. Um, uh, chronic maintenance uh, dialysis. Which dose, Iman, do you use? So, uh, uh, you know, like how there, there is um, like full uh, anticoagulation or minimum, and like uh, when you use uh, um, low, uh, unfractionated heparin, like if the patient is a, a, a clotter, we use a 40 uh, milligram of enoxaparin. If the patient is not really a clotter and tends to bleed, we use a 20. But it's like uh, usually we look clinically and, and like is uh, we don't really, really uh, order tests to, to see the uh, uh, like factor 10A or anything. We just see like clinically does the patient bleed with it, does the patient plot with it, and we decide like uh, going up or down on the Yeah, here for us is more expensive, so we cannot use we cannot afford to use it in uh, maintenance hemodialysis patients. I think we're using uh, like um, uh, an ungeneric uh, form soon. It'll be not really expensive. Inshallah. Great. Okay. So, Flavio, do, do you have any further considerations? No, I'm very pleased with the, the meeting. I've learned a lot. I'm happy. And I have to congratulate all of you for organizing this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I would like to conclude and thank uh, also Dr. Flavio once again. And thank you very much, Iman. I, I was very pleased that we had an international guest uh, from uh, the Middle East. Uh, and it was a brilliant lecture. And I would like to congratulate you once again and thank you very much for your time. And also Dr. Chago, my friend, that uh, helped us introduce. And, and Iman, I think we can 
uh, stay in touch. And I hope that you can come to visit us in Brazil and we can come to visit you in beautiful Abu Dhabi. And uh, sure. uh, uh, are, are the frontiers open already in Abu Dhabi to, to foreigners? Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, like with Expo 2020 in Dubai, there is, oh, no, yeah. there is no even like, uh, you don't have to stay home or anything. Like you can just... Okay. No I mean, quarantine. No quarantine, yeah. And Expo 2020, that's taking place in 2021, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the same with Olympics, right? It's the Olympic Games, yeah. What a crazy, yeah. what crazy times are we living in? But we're mm -hmm. we're getting through. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you all. Uh, I'll just say some words in Portuguese now to conclude in one. So thank you very much once again. Então muito obrigado a todos que nos assistiram. É, acho que foi um grande prazer novamente. Eu estou muito feliz com essa sessão e eu disponibilizo posteriormente o link no YouTube a todos, tá? So Iman, uh, thank you once more, and I'll give you the link for the YouTube meeting later on, okay? Thank you. Thank okay. you, bye-bye. <laughs>